them and try to figure out what's going on and, and discover that they have had some, some calamity in their life, some, some hardships, some crisis, maybe something similar to Job. You know, we mentioned early on in this book that one of the beautiful things about the book of Job is no matter what your trial is, there's a good chance Job experienced it. Right? He had loss of loved ones, loss of health, uh, broken relationships, financial troubles, like, like all these things he had. So let's say you encounter this person in the back row of the church who had just one of these things and it's weighing heavily on their heart. And so you listen to their story and you say, I, th- I think I can help you. Please, 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 please come with me. And you get in the car and you, you go out the driveway here and you take a left. And you drive down Southwest 9th and you take a right. And then you pull into the Blank Park Zoo. And you start going around the different exhibits. Say, look, a goat. Goat, goat. And see over here, look, an ostrich. Right? And then, and then a deer. Do you feel better yet? And the person's like, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? What, 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 how does that help? Well, oddly enough, and I'm not mocking God's approach here, but that's precisely what God does with Job. He shows him these different animals. And we, we could ask, well, why is that? Well, I think he is speaking to Job in, in a way he can be understood. Uh, this is even before scripture was at least readily available. Some, some parts of Genesis may have been written down, I don't know. Uh, but scripture was certainly not something that Job would have had easy access to. He probably heard some things from his great-great-grandfather Abraham. But there's a lot he doesn't know about God. But he knows the natural world. He knows the world that he can see. And it is our Father's world, and it tells us something about who God is. So God's creatures, his creation, tell us something about God. You know, it's the title there, Theodicy at the Zoo. Now, theodicy is not a word that we probably use in our normal uh, vocabulary. That is your assignment for the week, though, to try to work that into some normal conversation as you go along. But theodicy is just a theological term for the defense of God's goodness in light of the reality of evil. You know, that, that's what theodicy is. So it's the classic, you know, if God is good, why do bad things happen to good people? And there's lots of, of good, logical, rational theodicies that kind of discredit this argument uh, from a logical standpoint. And, and, and I think the short, easiest way to do this is just to force people to define terms. What, what do you mean a good God? What do you mean evil? Like, like what is evil? Is evil something that makes me feel uncomfortable? Is it like, like what, what is evil? What's a good person? And if you start like kind of pushing on this, it doesn't take very long for the kind of structure to fall apart. Because if there is no good God, then how are we even defining the word good and what, is it, what does that even mean? So the argument seeks to discredit the thing that the argument's built on, which is a, a concrete definition of good and evil. But that's all kind of the, the logical side of it. Ultimately, though, the problem of evil is not a logical issue. That's not really the hang-up for people. It's an issue of the affections. And so God points Job to faith, not through rational, apologetic arguments that those had those place, but by showing Job his creation. Look outside, and you can see the character of God. So God wants you to trust him in the face of suffering. So we're going to take a walk through the Theodicy Zoo and learn about God from the creatures of God. Before we do that, let's uh, pray here. Our Father, we do thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for the rain, uh, the reminder that you do sustain this earth and you nourish it in the same way you sustain and nourish us as well. And so we're grateful for your, uh, your grace that does uh, fall upon us as uh, the waters does, as the rain does. Thank you for uh, just the opportunity to be here with your people and to worship you, to look into your scripture and be guided by it. I do pray you would help us to see uh, something of your character tonight, Lord. Uh, show us uh, through, through the scripture, ultimately, and through the world you made, uh, who you are and what that means for us, particularly in the face of suffering. Uh, be our teacher this evening, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to just play along with me here. Imagine you're going through the zoo. And, and what sort of things do you encounter? There are different exhibits at the zoo. First, we're going to look at the goat and donkey exhibit. Uh, you know, some, some exhibits at the zoo have multiple animals in one cage. In our imaginary uh, zoo, the, the goat and the, do- and the donkey are in the same cage. All right? How do I know I can trust God? I think it's a very key question. That's really Job's key question. Is it, he doesn't doubt that God exists. He doesn't doubt that God's sovereign. He really doubts whether he can trust God. That's his hang-up. So how do we know I can trust God? What sort of evidence could you find for that? Well, one would be to look at the universe you're living in. Is this the sort of universe that appears to be governed by a loving God? 
the critic always wants to talk about the problem of evil. Why is there evil in the world? There's an evil and even more perplexing problem than that. Why is there good in the world? Where did all the good come from? If we are the product of time and chance and animals killing each other long enough until the strongest survived, why is there so much good in the world? Why do we even have a concept called good? The, the, the bigger issue is the problem of good. God uh, continues to press into Job the conviction that the Lord is God and that Job is not with these kind of rhetorical questions. We spent the last chapter saying, where were you, Job? Can you do this? Can you do that? Now he's going to follow the same kind of uh, line of reasoning, but zeroing in on some animals here. So look at the first four verses of Job 39. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the months that they fulfill? Or do you know the time when they bear young? They bow down, they bring forth their young, they deliver their offspring, their young ones are healthy, they grow strong with grain, they depart and do not return to them. So goats and deer, they give birth in the wild. In case you know that. And they do it without, uh, without facilities, without midwives, without training, without birthing tubs, without anything. They, they just do it. And again, uh, and yet they are so successful in the giving of their birth, and their young are strong enough that they can go out on their own, and they don't need to come back. And they, they don't come back because they can take care of themselves. So how does all this happen? Well, again, we're back to that elusive thing called instinct, which is the scientific name for animals are behaving way more intelligently sh than they should, and we don't know why. God has taught his creatures to live in the world. He's endowed them with the ability to survive and perpetuate their kind. I think there are at least two lessons that can be gained from this. Uh, one is God, God is bigger than us. That's just kind of the point he's trying to make. He is working in the created world in mysterious and effective ways. So Job, you can't figure out how this stuff happens. You can't make it happen. You can't control it. But God says, I, I do this. I, I'm in charge of this. And therefore, I, <laughs> I'm more trustworthy than you are, Job. But I think we also see that he's a caring God that takes care of deer and goats. I think Jesus would say, are you not greater than many goats? The God takes care of the beast will also take care of you. I think these two points create a balance. God is powerful, but he's not a tyrant. And God is good, but he is not tame. So God is authoritative. He is powerful, but he's not arbitrary. He's not capricious. He's not unduly cruel. And God is good, but not in like a um, soft, cuddly kind of way. He, he, he's good in a much more... Um, a, a much more magnificent and, um, and holy kind of way. We see that not only does God take care of the mother goats, he also takes care of homeless donkeys. We look at the next uh, few verses here, starting in, chat, in verse 5. Who sets the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the onager? Whose home I made the wilderness, and the barren land his dwelling? He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. God created the wild donkey to spurn domestication and thrive in the wild. The wilderness is his home. God endowed the beast, the ability to survive in the barren land, verse 6, to the point that he scorns the city, verse 7. God has equipped the donkey to thrive even in the midst of wilderness. And so, he has equipped his children to thrive in the wilderness of suffering and pain. When Adam fell, the earth was cursed. But God subjected it in hope. God hasn't taken away the barren land yet. He's getting around to that. But he has enabled his creatures to survive and thrive through it. And again, if God would give the donkey the resources to take care of itself, to make the wilderness its home... He will empower you to live a good and joyful life, even in the midst of pain. We're reading to Kate, um, the Little House of the Prairie series. I tell you that that series hits differently as an adult. My, my main thought reading now is like, what on earth was Charles Ingalls thinking? Like, you take your, just take my family to the middle of nowhere, and we're just going to like build a house here. And we're, we're going to do it. If you're actually like thinking about like as an adult, like that sounds horrific. <laughs> and I'm glad people did it, because we'd still be, I suppose, in the Tower of Babel somewhere if people didn't have a pioneer instinct, but man, that's, that's not my cup of tea. Um, so, like, seeing from that perspective, like, that was actually would have been a very difficult life. 
and yet you read those books and it's all painted through this very nostalgic, childlike pleasure, this, this enjoyment of that life. And I think that's kind of an illustration to us, that circumstances are not the determiner of joy. The, the, the donkey can have a good life in the wilderness. The pioneers can have a good life in the middle of nowhere. And that God does empower us to live a full and joyful and satisfying life regardless of what we're going through. So we have a kind and caring God. And this doesn't mean that he will remove all suffering. The mother goats were in pain when they gave birth. The donkey did have to travel miles to find something green that he could munch on. But in the middle of that pain, he cares for us. And he gives us what we need to experience peace and joy. Have you heard the expression, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? In a literal sense, that's true. Uh, but that wonderful plan God has for your life may involve you being tortured to death. And how do we know that? Because he never loved anyone more than Jesus, and that's what happened to him. The, the wonderful plan God has for your life may involve more pain and suffering than you can imagine. It will also involve more grace and peace than you can possibly imagine. Pain is real, suffering is real, but so is grace. We have the, a, a tender father who cares for his children and will give you the care. He, he will care for you. And, and he, he cares for goats. He cares for donkeys. He will care for you and give you what you need to have a good and joyful life in the midst of pain. So moving on now to the ox exhibit. God is a strength giver. He's not only a caregiver, he gives strength as well. God is powerful. And he has given just a microscopic portion of that power to some of his creatures. Let's read uh, verses 9 through 12 of Job 39. Will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed by your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in the furrow with ropes? Or will he plow the valleys behind you? Will you trust him because his strength is great? Or will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? Now, if you have a, an old King James there, it translates this unicorns. And I really want that to be the correct translation. I, I really hope this is biblical evidence for unicorns. It, it, it probably isn't, though. Uh, that's not what's going on. It's, uh, the better, most translations translate the wild ox, which I think is a good translation. The Hebrew word just has something to do with horns. It's kind of the idea. It's likely... Um, an extinct form of wild bull called an aurochs, which is some artist's rendition of that there on your screen. These things were massive. They get to six feet tall and had two and a half foot long horns. They're really big bulls. Interesting enough, Julius Caesar probably encountered some of the last holdouts of these creatures in Gaul. And he, he wrote about it for our benefit. And he said that they, quote, are scarcely less than an elephant in size. But in their nature, color, and form are bulls. Great is their strength and great is their speed. Nor do they spare man or beast when once they have caught sight of him. It's a, a powerful image of these, these creatures. Caesar also notes that they were nearly impossible to tame. They just couldn't, whatever the, the Gaulites did, they, they couldn't domesticate these things. Which coincides with what uh, we're told about in the book of Job. God asked him if, if this wild ox if, will serve man or feed from his manger. And again, I think that is, you, you can't domesticate these. Some, some cattle, wild cattle, you can domesticate. That's where we get all our cows. But this one, you can't. You can't pin him down. He will not submit to you. Job couldn't bind him or make him plow his field. The wild ox is volatile and untrustworthy. It was useless as a domesticated animal. The image here is of incredible strength that humans cannot master or control. We've tamed many animals over the last six millennia, us humans, but this beast we cannot tame. We cannot bend it to our will or teach it to obey our commands. And this raw, masterful strength is not even a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the power of God. The Lord, I, th I think he's taking something Job can kind of understand and using it to give him the slightest idea of something he cannot understand. I, I can wrap my head around the power of a bull, right? I think that's, we can all get our, our, our brain around that image. I cannot begin to comprehend the power of the one who made that power with his mere voice. Something that Job 
cannot control. He, he could not harness this thing. He could not bend it to its will. And God effortlessly created it. So God is the source of all strength. The wild ox's strength comes from God. And just as we cannot master or control the bull, we can certainly not control or master the creator of the bull. And this is important to Job. Job has seriously questioned God's right to allow suffering into his life. But God is reminding him that he doesn't have the qualifications to make that judgment. God cannot be controlled or domesticated. He is, if you will pardon the expression, not a tame bull. And challenging God is like riding a bull. You ever watch bull riding? They used to come in on, on, come in on TV on, on Sunday afternoons, and Dad and us boys would watch it sometime. And I got in trouble because I thought, you know, this is the oldest kid thing. I thought it would be fun to, like, mimic bull riding. And so we all took turns being the bull, and we'd go and climb on the back. we tried try to buck each other off. And I think that game kind of got, got vetoed. It was not a, a good idea. But it really is incredible to watch, and that's the kind of close we get to taming these things. If you can stay on the back of that bull for eight seconds, you're a legend. Like, you're the best of the best of the best. Eight seconds. Three, and you're, you're pretty good. Okay, that, that, that's as much control as we can have <laughs> over these animals. To get on their back for three seconds. And then run for your life as soon as you're bucked off. But I think, in, in a sense, <laughs> challenging God is like riding the bull. Uh, you, you're not going to win that fight. You, you will not um, overcome him. And God is gracious. I think, I think like Jacob... He allows us to, rest, to wrestle with him. He allows us to kind of think through things. And, and, and he is um, a merciful God that allows us to work through those issues. But for your own sake, the sooner you yield, the better. Submit to the power of God, even when it's uncomfortable and difficult. But here's what you also need to know. You need to know that the God who empowers the mighty Arox also empowers his children. It's often, it's sometimes an over-quoted <laughs> verse. But we, I've, I've argued before in this series that the context is dealing with all the circumstances of life, the whole range of things. That's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things can be overcome through the strength that comes through Christ. Whatever circumstances are, you absolutely have the power, the power of a wild ox, <laughs> not to be captured, tamed, or enslaved by doubts and temptations that arise during trial. Fear does not have to bind you with ropes. Doubt does not have to strap you to its plow, enslaving you to endless toil and anxiety. Trust in God, and he will give you the power of the wild ox, the strength of the wild ox. He is a strength giver. So now we move in our little theodicy zoo to a cage with a large, flightless bird sitting on the ground with its eggs. A little sign says ostrich and distinguishes it from other birds. Look at verse 13. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like the kindly storks? So an ostrich, wh when it flaps its wings, it does so very exuberantly. You ever kind of seen those? Some the zoo or nature specials, they kind of start flapping around. Swiss Family Robinson, that's a good, good example there. Uh, but these uh, wings are used very differently from the storks, which he is contrasted with in verse 13. They're not used for flight or for covering her nest. The wings, scientists tell us, uh, help keep them balanced when they run. And, and I want you to track with my argument here. It's going to take a little bit, but I think there is a valid point to this. And I uh, this section took me a little bit to figure out what the point was, <laughs> why this was being brought up, but I, th I think this is it, though. And so again, let's try to track the argument here. God has filled the world with many creatures that have unique characteristics and distinctions. But these distinctions do not make one creature more or less valuable than another. Each distinction carries with it a unique opportunity to glorify God. In fact, a creature is most glorious when they are embracing its purpose. I think we kind of understand this, right? What is the most glorious mountain? Well, it's the one that's most mountainous, <laughs> right? What is the, the best waterfall? It's the one that's most like a waterfall and most, most fits the ideal characteristics of a waterfall. What's the best flower? Well, it's the one that's most like a flower, right? Which is very different than the mountain. 
but uh, to the extent they both uh, match their own distinctions, they're glorious in their own way. And this is true of people as well. God does give us many different, distinct vocations. There are different genders. Of course, I mean all two of them. There are different locations, right? You're born in different t- places, and that affects you, right? Being born in the Midwest, being born in the South, which is being different than being born in Russia, different than being born in Zimbabwe, like that, that affects you, okay? There are differences. Different time periods. I sometimes get very bummed, and it looks like a lot of people in my generation do. I think there's a kind of um, millennial angst uh, that we were born in this particular time frame because <laughs> we lived just long enough to s- have seen the tail end of something that is no longer in existence. And, and I think there, there's some anxiety about that. Um, so we, we can become kind of bitter about this. I sometimes get very... Um, I just have this, this deep longing to have lived in the Middle Ages until I read about the Black Plague, and I'm like, eh, actually, may, maybe not. Well, it wasn't actually that great. Uh, but, but the point being is God has, in his providence, put you in this time, this place and this time, and he expects you to live accordingly, right? That's, that's not your judgment call. You don't get to make the decision. He did. He made it for you. You live right now. And that is a unique opportunity to glorify God that people 100 years ago and 100 years from now will not have. They'll have their own set of responsibilities. He's also given us different skills and abilities. He's given us different kinds of intelligences. I think everyone has some intelligence, but maybe in different things. Within the church context, he's given different gifts. None of these distinctions reflect your value before God, right? Men and women are both equally valuable to God. People born in this country or that country, equally valuable to God. We, we go down the list. But they do carry unique challenges and unique opportunities to glorify God. Okay, so going back to the text, God made ostriches <laughs> and he made storks. Both must honor him in their unique attributes. The passage then goes on to list some details that could be seen as disparaging to the poor ostrich. But all these details are the result of being a flightless bird, which is a thing that, you know, they cannot actually control. Uh, look at verse 14 through 16. For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them, or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern. So because the ostrich cannot fly, it ha- they have to nest on the ground, which does run the risk of being stepped on. I don't think verse 16 literally means uh, that ostriches just don't care about their, their young, but that it appears that way because they aren't able to provide for them in the way other birds are. So again, all all this seems rather harsh, (laughs) rather hard on the poor ostrich. But why is it this way? Well, we see it in verse 17 through 18. Because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. But then we have this thing at the end of verse 18. When she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. It's not that God didn't endow the ostrich with any wisdom or any understanding. He did not give her the particular wisdom to fly and nest in trees. But he gave her another kind of wisdom. Her speed is unrivaled. She scorns the well-ridden horse. So what, what's the point of all this? Well, God is a distinction giver. God, in his sovereign generosity, has given his creatures different wisdoms and different gifts. All are good, but they're unique from each other. So just as the ostrich does not have the wisdom to nest in the trees, so we do not always have the wisdom to know what is best for our sanctification. Job has insisted that he knows what God ought to allow into his life. He does not. God has not endowed him with that wisdom. And I think we must in humility accept our finitude and our lack of knowledge. We don't know everything but God does. We can embrace our small creatureliness and submit to the all-wise God. Just as God made ostriches and storks, he allows different trials and different struggles into different people's lives. And sometimes this seems unfair, this seems arbitrary to us. We can trust that there is a reason, even if it does not make total sense to us. The ostrich is not helped by gazing longingly at the sky. The ostrich is most glorious 
when running as fast as she can on the long leg legs God gave her, proudly flapping her flightless wings. And so the point is this, embrace the life that God has given you. Make it good and glorious. Submit to him, and, and in that submission, enjoy it. Love it, and praise God for it. Gratitude, I, I think this is really what it's tied to, being grateful for what God has given you. I used to think gratitude is kind of like a fluffy virtue. It's kind of like nice sentiment. I really think it's, it's, a, it's a strong virtue. It's a virtue that gives you vertebrae, that gives you a skeletal structure to withstand hard things. If you are a, a grateful person, a person who enjoys what has been given to them, it will be a lot harder to break you down than if you reject gratitude. So we have one last exhibit to get to, and then we want to look at the the summary application of all this. So again, for some reason, the designer of this zoo put the horses and the hawks in the same cage, which you know, I guess makes sense. Um, God is a resource giver. God gave each of these animals what they needed to thrive as his unique creatures. We start with the horse in verse 19. Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He paws in the, in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He gallops in the clash of arms. He mocks at fear and is not frightened. Nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him. The glittering spear and the javelin. He devours the distance with fierceness and rage. Nor does he come to halt because the trumpet has sounded. At the blast of the trumpet, he says, aha. He smells the battle from afar and the thunder of captains and shouting. It is God, not Job, who has given the horse strength, who has put lightning in his neck. He is not easily frightened. Instead, his, his snort inspires terror. Even at the sound of battle, he is not deterred by that. He rides into it. Valiantly, which is actually a hard thing to train an animal to do, but you can do it with horses. You can't do it with every animal. He mocks the sound of war. He says, aha, you know, the, the sound of battle, and it, the people want to run. The horse is like, aha, here we go, and he charges into the clash of arms. And we are told this strength comes from God. The Lord has given the horse the power it needs to carry men into battle. Also, we see that God... In his wisdom, he's equipped the hawk to survive in his world as well. Look at verse 36. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? On the rock it dwells and resides, on the crag of the rock and the stronghold. From there it spies out the prey, its eyes observe from afar, its young ones suck up blood, and where the slain are, there it is. So the hawk flies, you know, like stop right there, like that, that's incredible magic, right, in and of itself. Designed by God, it took humans about 5,000 years to figure out how to mimic it, how to like sort of copy it in our clumsy way, and apparently we can't do it very well because the doors keep falling off Boeing planes and stuff, but hawks just do it, and they do it, again, instinctively. They, they just know how to do it. Um, it, it makes its nest in these incredible cliff faces that humans can barely climb onto, much less make a home out of. With their incredible eyesight, they spot prey from afar. Somehow, when there's a carcass, they know it's there and they find it. These are incredible resources that God has given to the hawk. But that's what God does. He gives us resources to fulfill our purpose. He does that for every one of his creatures, including you. God has given the horse everything it needs to be a good horse. Some hooves, the right, the right lungs to get all that air flowing to make itself move, strong legs, a straight vertebrae so a human can sit on it. Almost like it was made to do that. It's really incredible. God has given the horse everything it needs to be a good horse. God has given the hawk everything it needs to be a good hawk. A set of wings, talons, eyesight. And God has given the Christian everything he needs to be a good Christian. 2 Peter 1.3 as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Every single thing you need to fulfill the directives God has given you, to fulfill the purpose and the mission that God has given you, 
you have the resources to do it. You have the Holy Spirit, you have God's grace, you have the body of Christ, you have the written word, you have the living word in heaven interceding for us. Everything you need. So when life is hard, and I do mean crazy hard, we must take by faith that God has given us the resources that we need to thrive through suffering. Because we always feel that way. When things are hard, it's, it's easy to feel like we just can't do it, like it's not a possibility. We can trust God that it is. The God who gave the horse hooves and the hawk wings has given the Christian the spirit of God, the power of Christ, the living word, and every grace needed to live a victorious and joyful Christian life. God's provision for his creatures, his animal creatures, gives us confidence that God will provide for us as well. So in all this, we have a conclusion. This is actually the conclusion of the last two chapters. So in 38 and 39, Job has, or God has been asking Job all these questions, trying to pin Job down and reestablish the right context for them to have a relationship. And so in, in all this, we have two pauses. So we're pausing now, and Job, God's going like, to talk to Job more directly. Then he's going to talk again about dinosaurs and dragons, and then he's going to ask him again, <laughs> Job, what do you want to do with all this? Do you have anything to say for yourself? And here we have Job's first kind of humbling. And then we'll have a full humbling again in verse, uh, chapter 42. We've got to remember that God has, or Job has been looking for an opportunity to debate God. He has said that multiple times throughout the whole dialogue. He just wishes God would show up so he could talk to him. Well, now God has shown up. And God gives him his chance to speak. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 40. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. God is gracious in allowing his children to ponder and question the difficult issues of life. But be careful. When you challenge God, you will get more than you bargained for. And we cannot truly arrive at answers unless we ask the questions from a heart of faith and submission. There's the only context in which we can um, truly have our, our answers or questions answered satisfactorily. We do see Job's reply. What does Job do with all this? Does he take this grand opportunity to tell God what's been on his mind? Three through five. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken and will not answer. Yes, twice, but I'll proceed no further. So after all this, chapters and chapters of Job being like, I want to talk to God. God's like, okay, Job, talk. And Job's like, yeah, I got nothing. I have nothing to say. And sometimes when we truly understand who God is and what he is like, we don't actually need the answers. We don't need to have all the questions answered. Job recognizes his sinfulness, says he's vile. But also I think even beyond his, his sinfulness, just his smallness. He realizes that he is not God. He is not the Lord of the universe. He does not have the authority and the right to tell God how, how he ought to manage his life. And he responds with submissiveness. He lays his hand over his mouth. And I think the idea of verse 5 is, yeah, I think I've said enough already. I've, I've said some things. I've left some steam. But I'm done now. I, I don't actually need to press this anymore. I'm willing to submit. Job spent pages and pages ranting about the injustice of God, but it didn't satisfy him. It didn't make him feel any better. Ironically, it wasn't until he held his hand over his mouth that he found peace. He acknowledges in verse 3 that he doesn't need to say anything else. There is a time to work through doubts and questions. I think most Christians have, who's the most godly people who've ever lived, David and Habakkuk and Job. But at the end of the day, we can put our hands over our mouth because God is who he says he is. We are not silenced before a tyrant. We are at peace before a father who is completely trustworthy. He gives us care and strength and distinction and resources. So as you face trials, remind yourself of who God is. You can see it in creation. 
This is our Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. You can see it most clearly in the scriptures. It's normal to have doubts and concerns and questions, but we can give up our right to answer those once we've listened to the voice from the whirlwind, once we've submitted our hearts to a God who knows best and who loves us and will always do what is right and good. So in trials, close your mouth, bow your knees, and open your heart to the love of the Father. Our Father, it is to you that we pray. It is to you that we trust in. We thank you that you are, that you are good, that you take care of all your creation, even the beast you have equipped to live and thrive in the world you made. And so it is with us. You've given us all we need for life and godliness. And we Christians here, who were created for your glory, who were redeemed by Christ Jesus, you've given us a purpose. And you will empower us to fulfill that end. Thank you for that comfort, Lord, and I, I just pray that you would help us as we uh, just travel through this life, as we make our pilgrimage toward our home with you, that we would be faithful, we would be, we would be restful, that we would just trust in who you are, and as, as doubts come, and they do, as, as trials come, and they do, help us to lean on who you are and to find joy and peace through that. Please bless us this week, our Father, help us to honor you in all that we do and say. We do love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all very much.